Welcome, everyone. My name is Maura Policelli. I'm the executive director of the University of Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs, Washington office. And on behalf of Dean Scott Appleby, I'm delighted to be representing the Keough School this evening. It is also a privilege to be here as a graduate of Georgetown Law. The Keough School of Global Affairs is the first new school at Notre Dame in nearly a century. And this past May, we graduated our first class of master students, some of whom are with us this evening. I see a few right in front here. We're also honored to have Dennis McDonough with us on stage this evening, representing the Keough School. Over the past several years, Dennis has been part of the Fighting Irish Family and helped launch our policy curriculum. As our recent graduates will attest, he's an amazing professor who challenges students to be intellectually rigorous and thorough in their policy analysis, arguments, and writing. Just as he was on Capitol Hill and in the White House, Dennis is a calm, steady force for good in the classroom. In keeping with Notre Dame's mission to place scholarship in service of the common good, the Keough School's nine centers and institutes focus on effective and ethically sound responses to the world's greatest threats to human well being. A tragic manifestation of global threats such as conflict, poverty, disease, and climate change is today's migration and refugee crisis. The 2019 figures from the United Nations are probably familiar to many of you. Currently, 70.8 million persons are forcibly displaced around the world, and we have 25 million refugees, half of whom are children. These are unprecedented numbers, the largest in recorded history. Identifying and promoting solutions to this crisis is a paramount focus of the Keough School. Our students are tracking the implementation of the United Nations Global Compact on Migration, and conducting comparative field research on migration policies and practices on the US-Mexico border and in Europe. Keough School faculty are undertaking research in refugee camps across Africa and throughout the humanitarian corridor in Italy and partnering with academics and other thought leaders in Central America to understand more fully the causes of Northern migration. As a Catholic research university, the work of our faculty and students is guided by a, by a preferential option for the poor and vulnerable, and by the script, scriptural imperative to lavish special care upon the stranger. So too, the Keough School community shares the conviction that the dignity of each person is the fundamental point of reference for any migration-related policy discourse such as this one. That is why Dean Appleby enthousi enthusiastically accepted the invitation to partner with Georgetown for tonight's gathering. Addressing the global migration crisis goes beyond academic endeavors. It also requires sustained collaboration among institutions of higher education, governments, non-governmental organizations, and policy leaders. It requires using our voices and partnering with others to stand in solidarity with our migrant brothers and sisters across the globe. While a partnership between Notre Dame and Georgetown, two mission-driven Catholic institutions of higher education, seems natural, especially on issues such as this, it does not happen often enough probably because there is no direct flight from DC to South Bend, as Dennis and I know too well. But this evening's dialogue is actually a direct result of a gathering last April at the Keough School's new Washington office, which included prominent faculty from Georgetown and Notre Dame with expertise on various aspects of migration research and policy. Many areas of interest were identified, and we all committed to finding ways to tackle the problem together. Not surprisingly, it was John Carr who came up with the first concrete suggestion, and here we are tonight. Georgetown's initiative on Catholic social thought and public life, under John's leadership, has been a powerful convener for six years running. 
Along with Kim Daniels and Anna Meshle, John has hosted 75 gatherings which have engaged thousands of leaders, faculty, and students of the Washington community. John has also served as a Washington columnist for America and is a residential fellow on religion and politics at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. John served for over 20 years as director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and now serves as chair of the board, uh, board for Bread for the World. It is my honor to be joining forces with him tonight for the first of what hopefully will be many joint efforts to do our part to solve the unprecedented migration and refugee crisis unfolding before us. John? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there are several remarkable things about tonight. The first remarkable thing is the turnout. Uh, we have hundreds of people here. <laughs> and only 20 of them are students in my seminar who were absolutely <laughs> required to be here. Uh, the, uh, the, the second thing is the remarkable uh, conversation we're going to have with distinguished leaders. We have a Democrat, we have a Republican. We have a DACA student and an attorney and advocate. We have executive branch and legislative branch experience. We have legal experience, we have activists. And we have two people from Mexico who were born there and two people from Minnesota. And, <laughs> which in some ways is also a foreign country. <laughs> Easy now. Yeah. <laughs> the, the big division is not between Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's between St. Thomas and St. John's. So uh, only about two people understand that. But. Yeah, and they're both Johnnies, and they're both here. There's one in the back, and there's Bill Seiler right here, class of 65. Hey, you're acting like a typical Johnny. There are a lot of... <laughs> Tommy's yeah, here. We know people. Like yeah. uh, so here's who we have. Uh, you've heard from the uh, Notre Dame Keogh School uh, Executive Fellow, who also happens to have served as Chief of Staff for of the White House under President Barack Obama. You're going to meet Carlos Cubella, who served in the Congress representing Miami. Uh, and has the scars to show for trying to build uh, bipartisan coalitions. He's finished a semester at Harvard and uh, continues to work to try and build up. He's shown remarkable courage on these issues. And we have Aria Summers Landsberger, who when we called one of our closest allies and friends and said, who could help us understand this? They said, you've got to meet Aria. Uh, she is the... Uh, Got to get this right. Vice President of Programs for the Grant Makers Concern for Immigrants and Refugees. One of the most remarkable things she's done, she wrote a report or co-wrote a report for the UNHCR on children on the run. And if you have not read that, it actually explains some of what we're dealing with. Now, I'm particularly pleased that we have Ms. Ram Bellman Guerrero, uh, who is a student here at Georgetown, a senior. Uh, DACA recipient, and uh, we'll be talking about the work students are doing here. The other thing that's really encouraging, and Mara referred to this, it's the first time the Keough School and the initiative have gotten together. And it's quite appropriate, it's around uh, the global migration crisis. These two universities share a biblical commitment, a mandate actually, to welcome the stranger. We share a Catholic faith which calls us to see newcomers and those fleeing violence and persecution as sisters and brothers. And we're committed to a moral tradition that requires us to defend the lives and dignity of God's children. So it's gotten 700 people together, two universities together, and a great panel together. Uh, I want, you've met Mara in addition to serving as the leader of the Washington office here, you may not know that Maura was chief of staff for Oxfam. Uh, she served in the Obama administration and the Department of Education, the Export Import Bank of the United States. Uh, she got a BA from the College of the Holy Cross and just happens to have a JD 
from a tremendous university here in the District of Columbia, Georgetown University. <laughs> uh, Washington usually begins with politics. Then if we're lucky, we get to policy. Every once in a while, we get to principle. And then somebody stands up and says, uh, we ought to talk about people and people's lives. And the divisions are overwhelming and paralyzing. I hope you noticed as you came in tonight the 3,000 small flags on campus that were put there by the college Democrats, college Republicans, and uh, bipartisan Hoyas. Students intensely committed their political agenda, thought it would be important together to mark this anniversary and what was lost. Many of these children uh, were barely born when that happened, but it shaped their lives. And as I saw them and thought about this day, I was struck by the fact that it is not words that we remember about that day, it's images. The airplanes going in the tower, the first responders going into the building, uh, the fire and the collapse of the towers, the, uh, the ash and the smoke. And even when we don't see the pictures, we can feel them. So those images are more powerful than words today. And as we focus on the global migration crisis, I would like to ask you to think about three images that are in my heart tonight. And then we'll turn to words. The first is a photo I'm sure you remember of a little boy, a Syrian boy, who drowned four years ago. His name was Alan Kurdi. He and his family was desperately trying to escape violence. And they got on a raft, and they didn't make it. And he was found on a beach in Turkey. And that picture is burned into our hearts and minds. That was four years ago. Three months ago, we saw the photo of a little girl and her father face down in the Rio Grande. She wasn't two years old, yet her arm was around her father. And they had lost their lives trying to escape violence in El Salvador. We don't have those pictures, but I think you can see those. A very different image for me that is also powerful is Pope Francis in the well of the House of Representatives, this little white solitary figure. I had the privilege of being there. And he stood there and he read these words in stilted English as a sign of respect for us. He said, our world is facing a refugee crisis of a magnitude not seen since the Second World War. This presents us with great challenges and many hard decisions. On this continent, too, thousands of persons are led to travel north in search of a better life for themselves and for their loved ones, in search of greater opportunities. Is this not what we want for our own children? We must not be taken aback by their numbers, but rather view them as persons, seeing their faces, listening to their stories, trying to respond as best we can to their situation, to respond in a way which is always humane and just. So tonight we begin not with politics, not with policies, not with principles, but with a person and a story. And that person is Mizraim Belman Guerra, who I introduced to you as a senior here at Georgetown. Mizraim, you have unique perspective and passion because of who you are, where you come from, the work you are doing, and how you came to Georgetown. Can you take a moment to share your story and tell us what we should learn from it? Definitely. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mizraim Belman Guerrero. I was born in a small town called Juventino Rosas in the state of Guanajuato, Mexico. When I was growing up, my father was in and out of the picture because of lack of economic opportunity. He saw he was working in the field since 
he was young, and after a while he began to see that there was no more opportunity for him to continue to provide for our family, so he took the opportunity to immigrate north. He came to the United States and got started working on roofing, and my family was back in our hometown. Uh, I was born there, and I grew up there for about the first four years of my life, along with my older brother. After this time, apart from our family, we decided we no longer wanted to live like that, and we saw that there was also a lack of educational opportunities. And so what my parents decided was to make the tough decision, leave everything behind, and immigrate to the United States. So we left our home, our families, and we got driven up to the border, uh, the Mexico-US border. From there, we, uh, my older brother, my mom and I, began to cross the desert. We were in the desert for a couple of hours until we finally reached the Rio Grande uh, River. From there, with none of us having any swimming experience, we had to find a way to cross this river. During this time, we had a, what is known as a coyote, uh, someone that was helping us cross the border. And he was fortunately able to help us get across this water, which was 20 or so meters uh, in distance, and we don't know how far in depth. I certainly couldn't touch the ground. And after that, my family was able to make it across the border, and from there, the journey was not over because we had to cross another border. Many people don't know this, but there is a checkpoint in the Rio Grande Valley in which you have to cross, in order to cross, you need to show legal documents. And so the way that my family was able to get around this is that we were in a car with another family who were US citizens, and I, since I was so young and fairly light skinned, I was able to pass off as their child, and my, while my older brother and my mom were in the back seat, or in the trunk, actually, and they were squished in there for a couple of hours until we crossed the checkpoint. Afterwards, they were able to get out, and we made our way to Austin, Texas. And since then, I grew up in Austin, Texas, always knowing that there was something different about me, that I knew, per se, that I was undocumented, but I didn't really know what it meant. That was until, I believe, around 2008, uh, when it hit me face first what it meant to be undocumented. I was in middle school, and I was coming back uh, in the bus. Uh, I was just getting home, and I enter, and uh, my mom, my dad, and my older brother are all there. My brother had just started his first year of college, and my dad usually works from uh, before sunrise to after sunset, so I was confused. Uh, then I come to learn that my grandmother had passed away. My grandmother had passed away uh, the night before, and my family was in shambles. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what we were going to do. We knew that our grandmother had passed away, and we wanted to see her. But the unfortunate reality was that we were not able to do that. We were not able to say uh, goodbye to my grandmother for one last time because of this border that separated our families and because of our undocumented status, we knew that if we were to cross the border again to be, to be with my family, that we would not be able to come back. And so my family made the tough decision of just staying put, dealing through it, and um, just continuing to face life. The unfortunate thing that happened after that is that a couple months after that happened, my dad was detained. My dad uh, was taking passengers and one of them did not have a seatbelt on. The police stopped them, asked them for uh, a license, identifications. My dad was able to provide that, but he was still detained and put in deportation proceedings. So in, within the span of a couple of months, I was really hit first hand with what it meant to be undocumented and the realities of being undocumented in the United States. And after that, and after a lengthy legal battle with my father's case, uh, fortunately, he was able to get a work permit, but I knew that I had to do more. I knew I had to do more, not only for myself and my family, but for my community. And so I began to get involved in advocacy through immigrant rights uh, organizations back in Austin, Texas, where 
I was able to do everything from lobbying and our state legislator here in Congress uh, to continuing to share my story about what it meant to be undocumented and how it impacted me growing up. Afterwards, uh, or having experienced that all throughout my high school years, I was then able to apply to come to Georgetown. I didn't know if I was going to get in. I <laughs> had all this worry about getting into the school that was my dream, and fortunately enough, um, through the hard work that I was able to put in school, but also my advocacy and my support and love for my community, I was able to show that I deserved a spot at this university. And since then, I've continued to be an advocate here at Georgetown, not only for undocumented immigrants, um, through Hoyas for Immigrant Rights, through Undocu Hoyas, both groups that support undocumented students on campus, and really being able to build a community uh, while going through all these turbulent times. And I think one thing that I would definitely continue to highlight in my story is that we often don't think about the real human costs to these situations. Uh, as I mentioned, my grandmother passed away back in 2011, 2008 or so. And then, as, as I have been here at Georgetown, unfortunately, uh, two more of my grandparents have passed away. And again, having to deal with these uh, situations where I couldn't control them, and now I can't control going back. So I have to continually face classes, face uh, extracurricular activities that I've continued to be involved with and love to be involved in but I have to constantly think about my family back home, think about my grandparents, that I was never able to see them in the 16 years that I've been here. I don't remember them since I was four years old. And that is what's at stake here. It's that families are separated. It is that families do not get the opportunities to say these things that become sort of mundane to us, that these things happen in everybody's lives and you think, oh, yes, I'll be able to see my grandmother, I'll be able to see an ailing family member, but for undocumented people, they don't have those luxuries, they don't have the basic human uh, dignity to be able to say goodbye to their loved ones for uh, a last time, and they face other um, challenges where they don't have access to the same rights and, uh, as any other person should have. Thank you very much, Ms. Ram. So I, I began by pointing to two very sad stories. This is a very complicated story, but in some ways a very powerful one. I would ask the other panelists, beginning with um, Aria, in light of this, what is, in fact, the core of the problem? We have lots of, you know, Mexico is going to build a wall. Everyone's going to be given a path to citizenship. All in between that. What are the, what's the core of the crisis? What are the human and moral consequences of this? We've heard something like about that. And what, in fact, should we be looking to do? And then I'll turn to... Uh, Carlos and Dennis on the same question. Great, thank you so much. It's such an honor to also be back here at Georgetown. I'm also a Georgetown Law graduate and School of Foreign Service graduate. So very honored to be here and with our panelists today. So I think as I reflected on this question that you posed to us and thought about what is it that's really at the core of this? And to me, it definitely transcends this policy climate we're in, it really goes into a existential, sociocultural core of who we are as a nation and our democracy really is at stake, um, in my opinion. <laughs> and I also reflected um, on my own faith tradition um, in the Torah. Um, I thought about how the welcoming of the stranger is repeated about 36 times, um, according to my esteemed rabbi. And um, I thought about this, and one of the reasons that really sat with me, I thought, why is this repeated so many times? Why are there so many stories about not oppressing the stranger? 
And one of the reasons that I came up with as I thought about our panel today is that it's actually very hard to welcome the stranger. And maybe welcoming the stranger actually challenges the better part of our human nature. And we're seeing that manifest itself in today's world. And I took that value and I started to reflect on where our nation is sitting right now. And welcoming a diverse set of migrants from all over the world in this very incredible moment of global migration and what it takes for a democracy to be able to receive and integrate and welcome a diverse community of strangers. It has to be a democracy that's civically engaged, that has a physical infrastructure, that people are prepared psychologically and culturally to receive. And I thought about 100 years ago, our country was in a very similar moment. Um, there had been record-breaking migration, and in the 1920s, there was an essential shutting of the door for about 40 years. And we engaged in some pretty terrible policies that had a devastating human toll. We criminalized crossing the border. That happened in the 1920s that we passed that law. Um, we also, um, did a forcible repatriation of Mexicans. We interned Japanese American families. And then in 1965, we had a shift. We passed a progressive law that opened and changed the demographics of migration. And my feeling is that right now we're on the cusp of that new era, potentially, of the closing of the door. And it's even more for me, because it, it does feel that there's some destabilization of our democracy. And alongside those threats, you have a narrative that's repeated over and over, that's xenophobic. And it's very hard to break through or to counter that narrative. And that narrative has really tapped into a deep anxiety that many Americans were feeling at the demographic changes, a sense of alienation. One study I remember actually said that many people felt a stranger in their own country. And we really have to honor that and validate that. And so what do we do <laughs> when I describe this? It feels quite big. And I think the first is really that human toll, that human face. We must defend those that are being impacted by policies right now. To me, that goes without question. So if you're in your community, there are so many ways to respond now. There are mental health impacts. If you have trauma-informed skill sets, you can use those. Legal services, you can use your voice. You can be civically engaged. Second, and this is very much a reflection of my engagement with philanthropy, but um, we think about the physical infrastructure for receiving newcomers. We have to build physical infrastructures inside communities across our country to be able to deal with that anxiety and to create welcoming spaces. And there are many organizations that have really dug into this and started to do this work. And then finally, my last point, is to really think about that narrative. Um, I'm in a university and I think of all the capacity to do research. And we are really struggling with um, a research-based narrative that can counter that deep anxiety that people are feeling across America in welcoming the stranger, across racial divides. This is not um, you know, with respect to any one racial identity. People all over the country feel this, and I think we have to find a narrative that honors that, but also welcomes that stranger, and we bring that value back into our democracy and build it from the ground up. Thank you, Aria. Uh, we've heard a story and some of those human consequences. We've had a context that helps us. We're at a specific point. We have families being separated. We have children in being detained in cages. We have an impasse in our country. We have tremendous division, which gets then reflected in our political life. Uh, you're Republican, uh, conservative. Uh, we're a member of Congress. You were chief of staff. You served on the Hill. If you were to take these two things, the context and the story, what is the core of the crisis and what are the steps which need to be taken to move beyond a, a really terrible status quo? Why don't I begin first with Carlos? 
Thank you, John, and, and specifically, I want to thank you first for finally getting me into Georgetown. I was waitlisted in 1998. <laughs> I've been waiting to hear for 21 years, and I finally got in, so thank you. Um, and, <laughs> and it's, a, it's really a pleasure to be here with, uh, with this wonderful panel and with all of you. Uh, just a, maybe a, a broad reflection first. I think uh, a lot of times people say that uh, the story of immigration is the story of immigrants. And I think that's so incomplete uh, because uh, the story of immigration obviously is the story of, of, of people who are displaced or who, or who move, but it's also the story of those who provoke uh, those uh, immigrations. For example, my family moved to uh, the United States from Cuba, not because they wanted to, but because they felt like they had no other choice uh, after Fidel Castro's uh, 1959 revolution. They lost their rights, they lost their property, and uh, they thought they could be in prison. And in the case of my grandfather, he was uh, placed in a political prison. The story of immigration is also the story of those who receive or refuse to receive immigrants. Uh, my family, thankfully, uh, came uh, in the early 60s, a time when this country uh, was in a different mood when it, uh, as it related to receiving uh, immigrants, and, and they were welcomed and treated very well. The story of immigration is also the story of those who live in communities uh, that are disrupted in some way by immigration. And that's, uh, we have to have understanding and compassion for those people too. I'll give you another Cuba example, because it's what I know best. In 1980, there was a massive uh, influx of uh, Cuban refugees, the Mariel Boat Lift, 120,000. Uh, most of the people who came were people who, who meant well and wanted to contribute and, and, and integrated. Uh, but Fidel Castro did something interesting in 1980. He opened up all the prisons and the uh, mental institutions and uh, sent all those people to the United States as well. Those people committed serious crimes in South Florida and throughout the country, uh, homicides, drug trafficking. So the story of immigration is, is uh, about a lot more uh, than immigrants. And, and the reason I wanted to start off saying that is because it's really a story about us. And I think uh, at this time when immigration is so front and center in our country for, for a lot of unfortunate reasons, uh, we all have a role to play. And, and what's fascinating about this convening is that uh, as a Catholic, I feel particularly moved and motivated by it because it's encouraging us to, to activate our Catholicism and, and, the, and the way we think about the world to solve these problems, not just to to attend mass and to, and to do all the other things that, that we should do as well. Uh, I think that, uh, and I always um, applied this as I uh, thought about policy making in Congress. I had the, um, the unique experience, uh, I'm not sure if I should call it the, the privilege, of serving under uh, two different administrations. And um, two, the last two years of President Obama and the first two years of President Trump. Uh, and, uh, you know, however you want to think about that, I certainly uh, got a pretty you know, broad perspective and interacted with all sorts of, of different uh, people. And I think that as a country, if we're going to address this issue, approach it in a constructive way, uh, in a way that's aligned with my Catholic um, beliefs and principles, I, I think we need to agree on two big um, ideas. One is that the United States has the right and the responsibility to enforce its borders, to honor the rule of law, uh, to demand that immigration to our country be orderly, predictable, uh, and such that it does not um, impose an undue burden on, on our citizenry. I think the other big idea that uh, we must uphold is that the United States uh, should be a compassionate nation that welcomes people in need, uh, that uh, affords opportunity to those in faraway lands who don't have the opportunity to cross uh, uh, one of our borders. Uh, I was talking to Dennis earlier, uh, reminding him of 
our last conversation, which he has no reason to remember because there are 435 members of the House and one chief of staff, but uh, Dennis and I spoke about trying to get the Trans-Pacific Partnership passed before Congress adjourned uh, in, uh, in 2016. And, and one of the reasons I'm so passionate, I was so passionate about that and about trade generally is that it exports opportunity. It, it brings light and, and prosperity to other parts of the world. And that doesn't mean it's taking it away from us. On the contrary, our own prosperity grows along with that, and we've seen that uh, in many cases. But I think those are two big ideas uh, that should guide our thinking uh, when it comes to this issue. Uh, what you're hearing now, as the debate for 2020 has already begun, is uh, one side, uh, the Trump administration, using this issue to instill fear in people to paint immigrants in a negative light, to uh, present Americans with a zero-sum scenario where if immigrants come, that means we automatically suffer. And then I'm hearing from some Democratic candidates, essentially, the idea that our borders really don't matter, that essentially anyone uh, who shows up or comes in should be automatically welcome and processed. Not all Democrats are saying that, but certainly some are. I don't think either of those attitudes is conducive to the types of solutions we need in this country if we're going to grow uh, from this issue. And I think, lastly, that solving immigration, and, and it's why and we maybe get into it later, why I spent so much political capital on this last year by signing a discharge petition and, and defying Republican leadership in the House, I believe that solving immigration, uh, passing comprehensive immigration reform is fundamental to healing our democracy and to healing the deep wounds that exist uh, in our society. So thanks again for the opportunity to come here and, uh, and chat about this. Welcome to Georgetown. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means they're going to be asking for a check on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> I was never rejected. I was waitlisted. I uh, <laughs> uh, so we have two people born in Mexico, one born in Cuba. Uh, my parents were born in Cuba. I was oh, yeah, born, I'm sorry. Uh, parents came from Cuba. Your grandparents came from Ireland. Yeah. You're one of 11? I am. Two the best one. What? The best one. The best one. <laughs> Uh, sounds like an Irish Catholic family to me. Uh, so you have that experience. You're the grandchild of Irish immigrants, and you've been a, worked at the highest levels of our government. Can you take a step back, and then we'll get to politics, but yeah. why is this important for the national interest? Why does the U.S. have responsibilities here? What is at stake for us? Yeah. And then you wrote a wonderful piece, I think it was in the New York Times, you took on Trump very directly uh, for the cruelty that was being used as a strategy, and you said opposing his policies was not enough for your party, yeah. that you have to offer some things. So first of all, uh, step back a little bit, yeah. why is this important, uh, and what is the core of the crisis? And then what is the responsibility of our government? And then we'll get to the responsibility of your party. Great. So it's really good to be uh, back at Georgetown. It's great to be with uh, my fellow uh, panelists. And it's good to be with you, John. The, so I think there's uh, a couple of big historic things to keep in mind. Um, one probably won't change. And one changes all the time. The one that won't change is that we're in the middle of a massively changing climate. And so uh, what unites or characterizes uh, as similar a lot of the migration crises that we're facing, whether it's the start of the Syrian civil war, or which, kind of st which started with drought and famine, uh, or whether you consider the massive movements of people in Africa, uh, where the population will double between now and 2050. And if you just consider 
the mobilization of people in Africa, just 3% of people who choose to leave their country choose to cross the Mediterranean. So just 3% of the people who move. So we've seen what that influx of people has done to politics in Europe and among our closest allies. And if we're gonna see a doubling of the population in Africa in this time frame, we have to, even if you just assume that the 3% remains constant, you're talking about a massive influx of people. So that's a big challenge that governments, not just here in Washington, but all over the world have to deal with. The second historic fact I think that's use, useful to think about is it's like there's a reason there's a Boston College and there's a reason why there's Notre Dame. And it's because Irish people weren't let into colleges in this country for a long time. And so, yeah, we have a tough history with this. So that's the bad news. The good news is that we've fought through every one, interring Japanese Americans, um, closing the southern border, you know, not letting Irish people go to public schools. Um, but each time we fought through it, and there's no reason to think that now is any different. And then you ask yourself, OK, so why is it not different? Uh, and normally, the thing I really like about the Keel School uh, is the commitment to have policymakers who understand the impact of policies on people. And I think that's something that's largely lost in Washington, but for a few people, and Carlos is one of those who never lost that. But I ask you to turn the telescope for a minute, which is to say, what is the strategic importance of the individual people? And for us, we know that uh, the cruelty, for example, that we've seen on the border does not deter people from traveling here. You have people who you just heard an amazing story who under significant pressure want something better for their kids. That's what I want for mine, all three of them, right? And so cruelty is not a deterrent. That's point one. Point two is what um, forced changes. So we've seen in the news in the course of the last week that uh, President Erdogan in Turkey is threatening that if he can't move a million Syrian refugees into the northern part of Syria controlled by Kurdish and American forces, then he'll send them west to Europe. So he's trying to threaten further instability in Europe um, as a lever to allow him to, to force Syrians back to, to Syria. But all the research on this demonstrates that forced immigration fixes don't hold. And the third thing is that not only do they not hold, but they beget even bigger challenges, greater instability. So if we were to not honor our commitment to uh, refugees in the Caribbean, for example, we risk even greater dislocation and greater problems. So there's this historic context, which is the world is changing, the climate is changing, but people still want to move. And we know what doesn't work. And I guess my hope is that, informed by um, history, but then also policymakers in this country and in other countries, we focus on what does work. And we know it works. You know, there's a, the, inter, the, the International Compact on Refugees actually recognizes an, an idea that says, OK, refugees are going to stay in the main closest to home for a lot of different reasons, but principally because refugees want to go home. They don't want to go somewhere else. They've been forced out of their homes. One of the defining characteristics of Syrians, of things that Syrians carry to Turkey is their house keys. You know, you're not taking those to move somewhere else, you're taking those to go home. So they stay in countries that are closest to their homes, which are usually in, unstable. And so our challenge is to 
do two things. One is to support those countries that are taking on the greatest influx of those refugees, one. And then two is we traditionally have taken the most vulnerable people from those places. Now, you know, the most we ever took was about 200,000 in 1981. That's how I got introduced to this topic, because my parents at St. Mike's Parish in Stillwater, Minnesota, where I'm sure they were told by the priest that we needed to sponsor refugees from Vietnam, because basically what my parents did is whatever the pastor told them. And <laughs> so that happened in Catholic parishes all over the United States. And so that's the second part of the deal. The neighboring countries take the most people. The United States then resettles the most at-risk refugees. And we're on the verge of a decision from the administration, even in the coming days, to go not for the traditional level of about 70,000 refugees a year. We're thinking about taking somewhere like 10,000. Or even somebody's arguing, some people apparently, according to press reports, are arguing for zero. So. We know the system works where we help our friends house refugees who want to go home, and then we resettle those uh, who want to uh, onward migrate. And the last point I'd say, John, which is I get the point that we've each made up here, which is, yeah, immigration can be destabilizing and people are uneasy. I get that a little bit, but not really. Because immigration works in this country. We're all here because we came from somewhere else. And that might have made somebody uneasy at some point, but that's not cost us a ruby red cent. It's not cost, cost us, as you know, Senator Byrd used to say, a thin dime. Immigration is a net revenue producer for the United States government. It's not a cost. So all that is to say that Politics aside, we should be for what works. We should be for what has made this country really strong. I mean, it gave us these three people. We'll leave us out of it. We're you know, a couple of hayseeds, but it's like, this is what happens here. So that's my view. Last thing is, you guys got to fight for your position as you did with the President of the United States. Right? This guy like probably single-handedly squeezed Obama down in Austin one night. Um, We're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> I, already, I already got it. That's the point. <laughs> but nobody else will make your position. Nobody else will make your argument. So you should make your argument. Because by the way, it's a pretty good one. And it's based in fact, and it's based in its successful history. I'll stop there. Before... I want to make the point that uh, Notre Dame is really lucky to have Dennis, but he got his uh, degree from Georgetown. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Uh, just, just a comment on your pastor in your parish. Uh, a couple of us are from St. Ambrose, and well, maybe two years ago, it was really interesting that uh, all the white liberals would get together in the basement and we would focus on a refugee family from Iraq or Somalia or somewhere. And we worked really hard. We worked with Catholic Charities. We worked with Lutheran. And it was everything it should have been. And now we have in our community a family and by all accounts they're doing great. The great irony is while we were meeting in the basement at the noon mass, we're 200 families uh, who uh, come from Central America, mostly some from Mexico. And most of the vitality in our parish is there. Uh, a friend of mine didn't like that. He was uncomfortable, as you said. He said, what the hell is happening to our parish? And it's usually about the parking lot and <laughs> mass times. And I said, it's real simple. It's being renewed. Uh, he said, what do you mean renewed? I said, we do funerals, they do baptisms. <laughs> <laughs> 
and we're better together, but we can't pass. You gave a little preview. Part of what we're doing is moving from context to policy to advocacy, and we have an example of advocacy. Um, uh, you talked about how you went through high school, you got involved, and apparently that involvement led you to an encounter with his boss. Do you want to share that with the group? Definitely. Um, so back in 2014, when I was when I had just turned 16 years old, uh, President Obama came to speak in Austin. He was there for a fundraiser, but he was also conjointly doing a talk on economic recovery since the 2008 recession. And this was an event open to the public. Uh, and so my brother and I uh, ended up getting tickets. Uh, we stood in line since 1, 2 a.m., uh, a couple days beforehand. And then in order to, and seats were, while you had a ticket, were first come, first serve. And so uh, we decided to again uh, line up the night before, I think that time around midnight. Um, and then doors opened at 9 or 8 a.m. the next day. And so we sat there, we were there overnight, and um, my brother and I both beforehand talked about this opportunity that we would have. The President of the United States would be a couple of rows away from us, and my family is living in fear of being deported every day. What can we do? What should we do? And we came up with a couple of ideas. Um, and so throughout President Obama's uh, discourse, uh, he was touching on the economic recovery, but he would also touch on immigration and immigration policy. And this was post DACA, so DACA was already a thing, uh, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, and my brother and I would glance at each other and say like, oh, like, should we do something? Like, you know, what, what are we feeling right now? And we just sort of like, okay, no, like, let's let the moment pass. Like, let's just continue hearing. And then uh, towards the end of his speech, he touches on immigration again. And we both had this intuition and we both just kind of looked at each other knowing what was at stake, knowing that my family, but millions of other families, are continuing to live in that fear every day. And so we decided to stand up and started to try to have a conversation with President Obama while he was giving his speech. <laughs> and that did not work out the best. Uh, we started to get booed. We, um, I met someone in line while waiting, and they were sitting next to me, and then they started tugging on my shirt, telling me to sit down, probably thinking I'm just this wild kid, doesn't know what he's doing. And, uh, and then President Obama turns to us and asks us, what are y'all yelling about? What are y'all trying to say? And we try to raise our voice to hopefully get him to hear our message, which was stop deportations and expand administrative relief, specifically for parents who were undocumented, who had undocumented children, or who had children that were citizens or US residents. And so um, he looks at us and notices that, I believe, White House staff or a Secret Service agent was coming to escort us out of the building, <laughs> and, which, I mean, we kind of expected. Um, but he says, no, stop, let them sit down, and we'll talk afterwards. And so my brother and I sit down, think, being thankful that we didn't get thrown out and get arrested by Secret Service. Um, and we figured we could then share our message afterwards. We certainly got the attention of the whole crowd there. And uh, to our surprise, once President Obama ends his speech, he looks at us, he looks our way, and gestures towards us. He's like, and when the president does that to you, your heart just you kind of... turn around and go the other way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so we didn't know what to expect, and the same person was coming, but now in a more friendlier way, was coming to escort us to the back. And uh, it was my brother and I and White House staff, Secret Service. And afterwards, President Obama comes and he asks, what were y'all yelling about? And so 
in this brief moment, we were able to share our story and we were able to share why we were fighting. We were fighting not only for our mom, our dad, but also the millions of other families that have to deal with the realities that knowing that just going to pick up your child from school, something that every family does, could lead to you being in deportation proceedings, could lead to you not seeing your family for years and years or ever. And so we shared with that, uh, and we also reminded him of his promise to the community that um, it was a couple weeks prior to that, and he had mentioned that if Congress did not act, that he would take action into his own hands, like he did with DACA, and support our, our parents and people that uh, he could, under his executive power, grant that to. And afterwards, we end, and a couple months later, in November, uh, DAPA is announced, and so that was our experience. <laughs> That, that, that's a great story. I'm supposed to tell people, I was supposed to tell you this a long time ago. Join in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag uh, NDGU migration crisis. I'm going to repeat it so I can say I did this twice. Uh, join in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag NDGU migration crisis. That, that's a powerful story. That is not today's story. Someone stands up at a rally and says to the president, you know, you're not listening to us. Uh, I don't know that you'd be treated the same way. We have families being separated. We have proposals for zero refugee admissions. We have the Congress completely stalemated. We have a debate tomorrow night in Houston where we will hear 10 people offer, I assume, some of their proposals. And the president will comment probably on Twitter after those. And the country is still divided. How do we use this moment, this campaign, this election, this reality, our faith, to make a difference on this? And I, I guess I'll throw it to anybody, but <laughs> Aria. Sure, uh, thank you. First of all, I should acknowledge Aria is doing great work with foundations. Uh, she talked about her Jewish faith. She was born in Mexico. Uh, she has a Georgetown degree and a GW degree. And she uh, has represented immigrants and refugees and done, and you ought to look it up, this wonderful thing on, on a company of minors. So we should acknowledge the background. But what in this moment, given this context, should we be doing? I mean, I, I think um, I'm sort of inspired by the spirit of the dialogue, so I also want to integrate that into my response. But um, I fear that we are in our own echo chamber when we have these dialogues. And I think what's really inspiring about Ms. Reem's story is that he, he was an organizer, and it was brought from the community, ground up. And that's where, that's where it's gonna happen. That's where change is. That's where we can break through. Because we are in this space, which is a wonderful space. I have many colleagues in the policy space who have brilliant ideas on how to move things forward. But we need to break out of the echo chamber. We do need to address people that are not with us. We need to bring them in. And I think folks that are organizing on the ground, that are building community engagement, that's where it sits. And, and that's where the power is to transform. And so it's really a call to action to this entire room. You all have individual power in your communities. And I think activating that in a way that um, is, reflects your values and that is courageous. Um, reach out to people who disagree with you, who you know are in your social circles. Reach out, find those civic institutions and organizations that facilitate that. That is where the change is gonna happen. I don't know that we can change the outcome of the 2020 election. Um, I don't know that we can change the policies. Um, I think a lot of foundations have invested heavily in the inside game in DC. But I think the strength is in our communities. And that's where I go back to, and I think that story is just so such a powerful example of that. Um, and 
And so I, I feel like that's, that's where I think the change is, and that's, and that's a long-term investment. It's not gonna change this election. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna take some time to rebuild our bipartisan mm -hmm. civility and our ability to really listen to one another and come up with reasonable policies. Carlos, you have uh, paid a big price for uh, trying to do things across party lines. The, the last time we really had a shot, it seemed, at uh, comprehensive immigration reform, it was a Republican president who moved it forward. Obama tried mightily, but met with enormous resistance. What, what can be done as a Republican, as a conservative, you made a good case. How do we transform this moment when it just seems like it's all about demonization or wedge issues or identity, how do we find some way to move forward? So I think the first thing we have to do is try to understand one another, especially in the context of this immigration debate. Uh, someone like me who comes from an immigrant family, uh, maybe when I hear some anti-immigrant rhetoric, it's, it's easy to just dismiss that and say that person's a racist or that person is a bigot or whatever it is. I actually don't think that's helpful. I think we have to understand what underlies. And, and certainly on the other side of the spectrum, I made a big effort while I was in Congress. So one of the things I did uh, one day, and I didn't, didn't get, purposely didn't get very much publicity, but I stayed at the home of uh, an undocumented immigrant uh, who had a couple children who were, who were dreamers and then a couple who, who had been born in the United States had dinner with them, slept there, went with her at some ungodly hour, I think 4.30 a.m. or something, out to ag country in south, uh, southern part of Miami and uh, started picking okra with her, Cristina. Uh, I mean, she did this till like 5 or 6 p.m. I, I was gone by 11 a.m. I, you know, I, I, I did as much as I could. But the reason I did that was because I, I wanted to understand what life was like. It, it's very easy to read about something or to watch the news, but it's a lot harder or a lot more meaningful to, and, it, and of course it takes a time commitment, and when you're in Congress you actually do have the time to do things like that, um, to understand um, people. I brought uh, a Syrian family to my office and that I did more to humanize the, the Syrian crisis, because I think you know, Syria being a country that most Americans don't know too much about, uh, there was a lot of um, just angst about that, and I wanted to humanize this beautiful family, two, two little girls who were twins. Uh, they, had a, a, they were actually triplets. Their brother was killed um, as the family was trying to leave Syria. So uh, I, I did a lot of work to understand that side of the immigration equation. I'm kind of disappointed that I didn't do the same amount of work to understand those who are fearful, angry, um, insecure, because those are fellow Americans, and we cannot just cast them aside. I think one of the big mistakes that Secretary Clinton did in 2016 was to just dismiss a large number of Americans. Mitt Romney did something similar in a different way in, in 2012. If, if you want to lead and if you want to change the world, you can't write off millions of people. You know, maybe, maybe there's one or two that certainly uh, deserve it in every group, but not uh, people. So we need to understand each other. And, we, and, and those Americans who are, who are not driving this, because this is being driven by people who are purposely exploiting immigration for political gain, but those Americans who are susceptible to that mm -hmm. need to be understood, and they need to be, and their concerns need to be addressed in a genuine way. And sometimes that might mean saying, well, you know, what you're saying is just not accurate, but it doesn't mean saying you're a racist or you're trash or you have no place uh, in our country, because okay. quite frankly, that's what some immigrants hear, and that's, that's uh, equally wrong. So, I think a part of this is really trying to understand people. Uh, that'll start healing the divide. And then just lastly, I really do think that this country needs uh, a transformational leader um, to be the next president. 
And maybe that means someone who says, I'm only going to serve four years and, and try to address the big challenges that are ripping the country apart. I'm thinking immigration, guns, uh, the environment, you know, the big controversial issues. We have some fiscal issues at the Obama administration with, uh, with my friend John Boehner, another good Catholic, I think one of 11 too, Dennis, uh, <laughs> try, tried, to, tried to address and, and got very close. Unfortunately, that okay. fell through. I, I, think, I think that's what good. we need. Uh, two things. Join the conversation on Twitter using <laughs> hashtag NDGU, immigration crisis, that's three. Uh, we're going to have a question period. The mic's going to be down here. We have a very full house. There are some people upstairs. Uh, I'm sorry, if you want to ask a question, come on down. And I'm going to ask Dennis. Uh, I tried to push Carlos a little on his party. And I'm going to push you. You had that terrific op-ed where you said, what the president doing is doing is wrong and cruel. We have an obligation to provide an alternative approach yep which is sane and effective. What should that approach look like? Yeah, good. So uh, thanks, John. And, and I, I, I want to go back just on one thing, lest I be misunderstood. I, I, I don't, I, I, what I don't want to do is ignore anybody's position. What I do want to underscore is the, the it's good to have this, the strength of your conviction. Mm -hmm. And I think that the pro-immigration pro-refugee, pro-American leadership on both position has historically been a Republican and a Democrat, uh, Democratic position. And that, that's so because it works. And, and so I, I just want, that's, that's the main thing. And that's why I feel quite confident that we'll uh, get back to that. Um, I think that some of the talk about how we should treat the border is, in, in our party is um, not helpful, but also not particularly illuminating. So there's this question of whether to decriminalize crossing uh, the border, which I think is uh, answering a question that's not being asked. Um, and if, I mean, this is, a, this is the Westphalian system, right? I mean, we're here at the School of Foreign Service, so we can talk about this, but the, one of the fundamental characteristics of a modern nation state is sovereignty. And you have, especially when you're president of the United States, you uh, swear an oath to the Constitution to uphold sovereignty. So as long as you're upholding that uh, position, there's going to be deportations. The question is, using your enforcement authority as a president, how will you prioritize deportations? And um, we, so President Obama, we got into this. I mean, we had a lot of guys like Mr. Aim who really pressed him. Louis, and Louis Gutierrez, right? Louis Gutierrez. <laughs> and you know, he was called all sorts of names. Um, and that's because we kind of wrestled through where to find the right position. And by the end, by, by basically by 2014, we argued that we would enforce, uh, we would deport um, felons and recent arrivals who were not in asylum proceedings. Recent arrivals who were in asylum proceedings were uh, allowed to proceed, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we tried to find the place that allowed the president to uphold his obligation to protect the sovereignty of the country and the sanctity of the borders while remaining consistent with our history, as I said several minutes ago, of an immigrant country. Okay. Uh, folks, come on forward, identify yourself, and offer a question. I always say this, and it sometimes works. Please put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> Thank you. Join us. Come forward and talk right into the microphone. Hi. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm from New York City. 
the historical melting pot of our nation. Um, so uh, thank you all for your insights. Um, so my question is, in light of the immigration issues and stalemate in our government, um, how do you think that it could impact health policy in our nation? Okay. How about we have a whole bunch of people in line. Let's do two at once, and I'll ask the panel to respond. Join us. Hi, I'm Alexis Gorefine. I'm from West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, and so we've been talking a lot about internal policy changes, and I was wondering, too, I've heard some conversations about American involvement in other countries, such as in Central America, to help those nations, because a lot of times there's violence from those nations that cause our immigration problems. Do you think that's helpful in the immigration conversation? Is there space for those kind of solutions as well within the conversations? Okay, thank you. Healthcare and intervention in other countries. Who wants to take a stab? I have something on the second question. Healthcare, I'll, I'll leave to someone else, but certainly uh, making investments abroad, uh, it has to be a major component of any immigration and foreign policy. We have the Alliance for Progress with Central America. That needs to be uh, funded more. The Obama administration did a very good job of demanding funding for that initiative. Trade policies can be very helpful. One of the reasons why we've seen um, uh, an insignificant number of undocumented Im immigrants from Mexico uh, is a tribute to NAFTA and to a, a trade policy that thought of the United States and Mexico as, as and still to, to a great degree does today, um, as uh, partners that can grow together and prosper together. So uh, certainly uh, direct for, uh, investment in foreign countries, smart investments, because you don't want your money to be squandered, smart investments do make a big difference. Okay, healthcare? Uh, I was going to also go to root causes, so I'll, I'll do, do the, the complimentary. I can do, I can do a little piece on healthcare. I'd love yeah. to hear from um, our colleagues here, but just to complement the trade focus, I think there's also a humanitarian question. Um, clearly, U.S. military involvement um, in Central America has created a great amount of destabilization in those countries, wars and genocides through which we see the current um, forced migration situation, and it's, it continues. And so I think um, certainly complementing the economic and trade focus, we also want to um, build up um, the infrastructure of the governments, their ability to function effectively to protect their own citizens from violence um, and oppression. So I think we want to do a complementary strategy, and it's really elevating the groups that have the capacity to do that. And, um, we've not taken such a positive turn in recent days in this space, so I think it, it's a necessary corollary to the trade piece. Um, okay. Healthcare. On healthcare, I'd just say, I, 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 you know, this is probably the outlier position, but the, uh, you know, we got 67 votes in the Senate for comprehensive immigration reform in 2013. That's not that long ago. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, the House leadership to take that up, as John suggested. But that. There are bipartisan coalitions for things to be done on health care, maybe something on drug pricing or something like that. I think the big questions, it seems to me, is going to be really hard to get to. Um, you know, these questions about fundamental changes to the overall health care system that, that being debated among the Democratic candidates. Um, that said, I think the next president is going to have to be able to execute. And, you know, I think you get elected on a motion and I think you get reelected on execution. And I think that uh, the next president is going to have to prove that uh, she can, or he, <laughs> can, uh, can actually do stuff. And I hope there'll be more mus muscle memory up on Capitol Hill to get stuff done. OK. Dylan, Dylan, as an old colleague, is really on the front lines of this crisis. Let's do three at once for this as the line gets longer. Dylan, welcome. Thanks, John. Uh, my question, and it's really to all of you, uh, has to do with hope. And where's your hope? Um, I haven't heard a lot of hope. I've heard a lot of settling. I've heard a lot of saying we need to get back to sort of the bipartisan consensus about securing the border and respecting our values. And I'm coming from, as John said, El Paso right now. Um, and just over a month ago, we had the death of 22 Latinos uh, who were killed because they were Latinos and because they were in El Paso. 
uh, and there are 24 folks who were injured. And we're still suffering with the reverberations of that. Physically, the wounds are still open, spiritually, psychologically. One of the things that struck us in El Paso, reflecting on this, is that the same politics of fear and exclusion that drove the massacre of those 22 individuals has been the same politics which drives the demonization of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers at our border. And taking the reflection a little bit further, when we think back, although this is, may seem like a modern contemporary phenomenon, the demonization of migrants at the border, in reality, over the last several administrations, both the White House and Congress have enabled this because there's been but one strategy at the border, and that's a strategy of deterrence. And it has two sides, criminalization, we criminalize more and more people, and militarization, we harden and harden more and more our border with militarization. You mentioned the, the, the importance of narrative, and I want to commend you for that. That work, I think, is important because it has to do with the hope that I'm going to ask you about. Because I think that what we saw in El Paso was someone who came into our community with a narrative of hate that was written out. In El Paso, we've been receiving thousands and thousands, sometimes a thousand people a day, released into our community who we've helped. And I think El Paso has a written counter-narrative, which is one not of hate and exclusion, but of hope and human dignity and compassion and justice. And I think that those, that narrative can help us rethink some of the policies that we enact on the border. Things like sovereignty, Mr. McDonough. You mentioned that we, we have to you know, obey the principle of sovereignty. However, we can think of sovereignty as a line that we have to harden, that protects our country, uh, that we have to make sure is, is secure. Or we can think of sovereignty as a principle that helps us as a nation to respect the human rights of other people. So I think that we do need narratives to explode the blinders that we bring to these debates that are driven by politics and not stories and people. And so my question to you is, how do we bring that narrative that I think that we saw on display in El Paso with generosity and compassion? How do we bring that narrative to our politics in a way that's effective so that folks like you are not having to yell at the president on the, on the margins and on the sidelines, but we can be at the center of the debate to okay. drive new policies? All right. Megan you, Hamilton, Dylan. Franciscan Mission Service. I worked for, I very, believe very strongly we do need to talk to everybody about this. I worked as a prep cook in a kitchen in southern West Virginia for the last year, and my boss named Jeff was not a racist. He wasn't the stereotype we see about West Virginia on the television. He was an independent thinker, and in many ways he was surprisingly progressive on different issues. But he remembered when Mexican immigrants had been bused to West Virginia to build the pipeline. So when I, in a state that doesn't have squat for jobs, and this is a working class kid whose father was a raging racist and he wasn't because he learned how to not be racist in a comic book. But I, what do I say to Jeff about, you know, who has had firsthand experience of immigrants taking jobs? There's not that many immigrants around us to show the economic energy that comes from immigration. You don't see that like you, in what southern West Virginia like to do in other places. And for those of us that are having those conversations, I did a lot of listening and a lot of respecting, and that was good. But I would love some suggestions on other things that I can say to my wonderful boss to help open up his mind. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. One more, and then we'll ask the panel. Uh, hi, I'm Bob Beeson. Um, I couldn't afford to be a Johnny or a Tommy, so I went to St. Cloud State. Um, <laughs> But my question is specifically to you, and it relates to St. Cloud. Um, good, small-town Catholic community that is being torn apart, not because people are coming in there now, but because of the people who have been there and aren't being accepted. Um, the guy, there was a big article in the New York Times just a couple weeks ago that the guy who was the leader of the Muslim community finally gave up and moved to Minneapolis because he couldn't stand being there anymore because he wasn't getting any type of support from the community. So uh, a forum like this is great to talk about things on the national level, but 
how do we bring it down? You touched on it a little bit earlier, uh, getting out of the echo chamber. How do we bring it down to the cities like St. Cloud, where we can try to really make progress there and make it more accepting at the local level? So three things, uh, a hopeful and alternative narrative. How do we listen better? And how do we bring this local? Comments from the panel. Yes, sir. Ms. Rehm. Um, so touching on uh, all the questions, um, with one answer, pretty much, and that is um, really looking at migrants for and supporting their resiliency. Migrants have consistently showed that no matter them facing war, U.S. intervention abroad, climate change, that we are a resilient people and that that is where my personal hope lies in that these people that, and including myself in it, uh, are faced with the worst adversities that life can offer at times and they continue to prosper. And when we think about immigrants, it's important to also not just think about people per se, like myself, who have the privilege and opportunity to come to an institution like Georgetown, but to think about those people like my mother, who is a stay-at-home mom, and that's what she does. That's what she loves to do. And uh, while, no, she might not be out there creating a cure for cancer, or she might not be making, uh, starting a new business where she employs 50, 100 Americans, uh, but she's just as important, just as valuable. And having those conversations, and I think it was touched on earlier, is doing that grassroots organizing, getting back to the local, as was mentioned, is what is really at the core of this. This is a global problem. This is a national problem. But as we've talked about, it starts with people. And it is the people that have faced the worst and continue to thrive under these circumstances is who I look forward to. And those are the people that I look uh, for guidance in anything that I do. Mm -hmm. All right. um, I'm going to tackle them as well in a group. Um, first, um, just thank you for bringing El Paso to the floor. Um, I was in El Paso the week before the shooting, and I was very um, just inspired by that generosity. I was on a Hispanics and philanthropy tour there, and we had a panelist of journalists who said, we can't get our stories picked up. We have beautiful stories of people crossing difference, coming together for community, and we can't get our stories told. So we need to understand the connection between narrative and media. We, we're not able to break through our contemporary media structures. And so we have to be creative. And I think that's where we have to spend some energy as well. On the story in Southern West Virginia, I mean, I, I, that totally resonates with me. I feel that in philanthropy when I go out to communities. And I think, um, I don't have the answer, but I, I do think that what you're doing is, is exactly the path that we want to go on. And I think it's trying to understand, you know, is, is your anger and resentment towards the recruiter who brought people into the community without acknowledging you? Or is it towards the people that were brought? So looking at the structures that create this, the Mississippi raids, it's a very similar story. Corporate recruitment brought hundreds of workers into that community and probably displaced people as well. And there was nothing targeted at that recruiter, at the corporate practices, that created that alienation within that community. And so I think it's trying to understand who is it that we should look to to change this dynamic and not punish the people who were brought over. I think that's something that I, I struggle with, too. I don't know how to. I think some of our faith-based folks could really help us with that. So. And I think the power of storytelling is critical. Uh, we do work with a group called the New American Economy, very constructive organization in this space, and they've embarked now on a mission to tell the story of immigrants. So that story about the displaced worker is, is very powerful, and you can't help but feel bad for someone like that because it's, you know, if you're looking for a job and you see people from another country, maybe who aren't even in our country legally getting those jobs, you can understand how that would uh, 
create some resentment or, or um, just negative feelings. But that person also has to be made aware of the many immigrants who are caring for sick elderly people, who are caring for children, who are um, working out in the fields uh, so that we can buy food products at reasonable prices or, or less expensive than if those people were not there doing those jobs. So there's, there are many stories, and they all have to be uh, reconciled. And then on, on hope, I'll say this to be, to be candid. I am hopeful that our country is going to come to a better place on immigration. I truly am. And, and I saw in Congress what, what was possible, even though we didn't get there a lot of people did want to do it. They just lacked the courage, and that's why I really think we need a leader who will uh, fill people with courage, or at least push them. I'm not hopeful that we're going to have an immigration system or a set of policies that will satisfy every American, because there are some Americans who will not have peace until every undocumented immigrant is deported. That is never going to happen. Even if it was a goal, it would never happen. Uh, there are also some Americans who are not going to be satisfied unless every uh, immigrant uh, who is in need is welcome into our country. And that's not going to happen either because it, it's just not a realistic policy. So the goal, I think, is to create an immigration system that abides by those two big concepts that I expressed early on. Okay. Uh, Can I just say one thing about uh, just two things? One, the, the most hopeful thing is, these, is the students. That there's just no doubt that, that we're going to screw everything up and they're gonna, uh, they're, they'll unscrew it. And so uh, that, that, seriously, I think it's, it's the best part about going to, Georgia, to Notre Dame. Uh, and it's the best part about coming here on campus. And I see that why you know, Father Leo stayed here as long as he did. So that's one. Two is on the St. Cloud thing, I, I, I just call your attention to the St. Cloud Times editorial that completely, utterly, and totally rebutted the New York Times story. And then go look at Tom Friedman's uh, column about Wilmer, Minnesota, which is just south of St. Cloud by about 50 miles. And that tells you a story of migrants traditionally uh, really making our agricultural economy in Minnesota work. And that's true in Wilmer, and that, by the way, is true in St. Cloud. It's not my place to respond to questions. I would just say to Dylan's challenge, it was more of a challenge than a question. Frankly, the narrative you offered from El Paso is a wonderful sign of hope under brutal circumstances. We got lots of people. Let's do four at a time. And I would ask short questions and shorter answers. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am a student at Georgetown. I am also a South Floridian. Um, so my question is mostly directed to um, the congressman. But um, in Florida, it's, un it's unique in, in that we have immigrants from Cuba, as you talked about. We also have a lot of refugees from Puerto Rico. Um, how through, uh, specifically in Florida, but maybe more generally, but how through churches and other institutions do we take care of people who are already there um, and maybe struggling? So. Okay. Sure. And, Thank you. Oh, that's right. Um, Four at a time. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Sam. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. And my question is, how will U.S. immigration policy have to change in the future, given the impending possibility of climate-based refugees, given like the rising sea levels or desertification or sh food shortages? Okay. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a student here at Georgetown from South Florida, like Congressman oh, come on. also a Mass Canosa scholar. Yeah. So my question is also about the Cuban American community, because a recent poll came out saying that 58% of Cuban Americans, no matter who the Democratic nominee is, would vote for President Trump. And many Cuban Americans, though, suffered a lot of the pressures that Mexican American immigrants are facing right now, or Muslim American immigrants are facing right now, support this current administration's policies, how do we respond to the internalized like, self-amnesia, like selective amnesia that our community is facing in response to immigrants now from the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Latin America, and of course from the Muslim world? Okay, one more. Pull that mic down <laughs> if you can. All right. Um, thank you so much for uh, doing this. This really means a lot. My name is Daniela. I am also a DACA recipient. and. Um, my question mainly goes for when are we 
realistically going to be allowed out of the shadows. Because even though we do have this protection from the deferred action, you know, it's constantly being threatened, it's in the courts, it's, it's constantly being attacked to, and it's being used as a political, you know, treat or something. And it's, it's tiring. I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing from my lawyers, you know, renew as soon as possible because we don't know how long you're going to have it. Mm. You know, it's, it's constantly walking in shells even though they say, you shouldn't, you're protected, but not really. When are we really going to be allowed to breathe? Is there, can you give us any sense of how would a future look like two years from now when I have to renew my DACA again? Maybe if it's still there. Okay. So climate refugees, uh, Cuban support for Trump. I think the two of you ought to have a drink. Uh, <laughs> Just how do we finally uh, come out of the shadows? And I might have missed one. So I'll take the two uh, South Florida questions quickly. Uh, number one, the first question, a reminder that Puerto Ricans are not uh, immigrants. They are U.S. citizens. <laughs> They, they, they need help and, and they must be supported as well, but they uh, have an absolute right to go anywhere in this country that they'd like to go. Uh, on Cuban Americans, yes, there's a lack of solidarity uh, from a lot of Cuban Americans towards other immigrants. A uh, couple reasons for that, in my opinion. Number one, Cubans had a, a, a different um, experience and until actually right at the end of the Obama administration, Cubans could actually come to the United States and would automatically essentially have legal status. The Obama administration changed that. I actually think it was a smart policy change, uh, even though I didn't agree with the context of it. Uh, secondly, C uh, Cuban American voters uh, tend to vote a lot based on foreign policy and less so on domestic policy. Dennis talked about people leaving uh, their countries with their keys. It's been 60 years, and some Cubans still have their keys because they, they're thinking about going back to Cuba, not uh, in reality, you know, at least in their mind. So that's the explanation there. Climate? I'll tackle that. So I think we're already here. Um, there are, um, there's forcible migration on the basis of climate change happening now, so I think it was a great question. I think we do have to work better together to um, link up the immigrant rights movement with climate justice movements. Um, I think that hasn't happened, it hasn't been well funded, there are some really great thinkers out there, they just don't have resources to collaborate together. And I just want to do one note of caution, which is in the historical conservation movement, it did have an anti-immigrant strain within it related to population growth. And uh, there are some great articles out there on this. I encourage you to take a look at that if you're in the climate justice and climate change space. Um, but it is an opportunity ripe now. Mr. Just I'm very quickly on the, uh, the when. Um, as far as coming out of the shadows, I think that uh, first and foremost is a personal decision. People have the right to disclose their status, whether or not, and especially in times of fear, it can be really difficult to disclose your status. I think one thing where I see hope and where I feel comfortable in sharing my status is in seeing the community supporting community organizing that is being done by immigrants. and. We have to think back as well in our history and that DACA is only seven years old now and there has been a time where DACA wasn't a thing and courageous undocumented folks stood up, protested and continued to fight for what they knew was right and I have hope that we'll uh, see that change in the future. Great. John, real quick, uh, the first question, uh, young man asks, how can we help? This will probably be appreciated here at Georgetown. My favorite charity is Jesuit Refugee Services. Uh, it helps people oh, here, all here. over the world. Shameless. And, yeah, and on DACA, one of my biggest accomplishments in Congress has nothing to do with passing a bill. It had to do with getting a majority of House Republicans to vote in favor of a path to citizenship for over two million dreamers. A lot of people don't know this happened. It happened uh, in the summer of last year. 
And a lot of people thought that was impossible. The bill didn't pass because a lot of Republicans voted against it, but a majority did vote for that. And that was the only part of that bill that I was unwilling to negotiate on. DACA recipients had to be fully protected and had to have a path to okay. citizenship because I consider them American. Uh, I'm getting the high sign that we're over time. I had a wonderful conclusion. And instead of that conclusion, I'm gonna ask the poor people in line to have a chance to raise their point, ask their question, and we'll have a very brief response and then we'll wrap up. I really ask you to be brief. Sure. Uh, good evening, my name is Alexey Kolenko and I'm recent Q School of Global Affairs alumni and a uh, research fellow at Eurasia and Transition Center. Uh, my question will be about uh, migrant detention centers. During Barack Obama administration, there was in-country refugee processing piloting project, uh, first offered for children then for adults coming from uh, Central America. Uh, it was a form of uh, original response to the crisis, and lately the project was shut down. Given the frequent changes uh, in political parties and administration, is it possible to offer long-term solution which will improve conditions in detention centers and sustain uh, send them home rhetoric? Okay. Thank you. Marie? Yeah. Yes, I'm Marie Dennis with Pax Christi International. Um, over the last many years, I have been in too many places where people are fleeing from violence and war. I would like to ask a question that goes back to root causes. What are the most important foreign policy changes that the United States should make now in order to rejoin the family of nations and address these problems together rather than worsening them? Thank you. Hi, my name is Margo Ochoa, and I was born and raised in McAllen, Texas, on the U.S.-Mexico border, and I'm a sophomore here at the School of Sport and Service. Um, I work for King & Spalding as a consultant and English-Spanish translator for family reunification cases, and this summer I took the head of pro bono to Matamoros, Tamaulipas, which is in my border sector, so he could see the Migrant Protection Program, Remain in Mexico program, and conduct Know Your Rights trainings with King & Spalding. I was also able to witness the border bill this summer as an intern in Clyburn's office. With that being said, I've touched on a lot of topics that the administration has, or a lot of immigration uh, topics and immigration uh, merits that the administration has created. My question is for Corbello and um, Mr. Dennis. I'm wondering, we, a lot of times in my job, we talk about moving forward, what policy can better the situation, whether that be being in Mexico and looking at asylum seekers being turned away, or uh, the conditions in detention centers, as well as, which is what the border bill was about, um, and also family reunification cases. Will those families who are separated by Trump's zero tolerance policies be able to benefit from any legislation moving forward. So I wanted to hear from both of you from either side of the aisle what you think moving forward legislation could be that could benefit those topics. Okay. Uh, this question is for Dennis. It's a friendly question, but it might not sound like one. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the Obama administration, it was a tale of two terms. In, on immigration, where the first term was record deportations, putting immigration reform on the back burner, et cetera. You mentioned, and I like to think the second term was much better, and I think it was because you were chief of staff, frankly, but. Um, Thanks for the question, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned in 2014, you discussed in the White House about who you were gonna deport, deport. I wanna know what the discussion was in 2009 what the political rationale for the massive deportations and the record deportations under President Obama in the first term. I wanna know what the rationale for that might have been. Yeah, this is gonna be a matter for you and Dennis to talk about. <laughs> uh, the other questions, very briefly, uh, foreign policy, uh, maybe one thing uh, that we might mention, and question of detention, and sort of how do we make this incredibly complex thing better. A final comment based on that or what's in your heart and what you haven't said. I'll tackle. Ms. Ring? Oh, sorry. I was going to tackle detention centers, but go ahead. Go. go. <laughs> okay. Detention centers. Sign up for Detention Watch Network. Engage in divestment. You can divest from the companies who own and operate these private facilities. <laughs> 
And there are organizers across the country that organize at specific locations. So grassroots leadership is an example in Texas. So I'm happy DWN has all of that information that you can access. Carlos. I'll just say to the uh, question about what can be done or what policies can be passed, a, a lot of people on the Hill, especially Republicans, but also uh, some Democrats who uh, have criticized this concept of comprehensive reform. This system is so complex and there's so much wrong with it that it's the only solution. And, and a lot of different questions were raised. You know, the, the facilities that we have, our facilities are designed to absorb uh, young men because that's what illegal immigration used to look like mostly when those facilities were built. Now we get families. Our, the, the, the facilities that we have, forget detention facilities, just to process people because you, you need to process people. They're just ill-equipped. So, uh, you know, the comprehensive bill that we put together, we had a, billions of dollars in investment for new facilities that could um, humanely um, hold uh, individuals while they're being processed. But uh, the only solution, and I think the only way anything gets done is if everything or almost everything gets done at, at the same time. Okay. Good, I'll, I'll defer to Carlos on that. And he knows that a lot better than I do, that's for sure. Uh, I'd say just a uh, uh, sister Dennis's, uh, sister Marie's uh, question. Look, I think uh, I'll say what I said earlier, which is uh, I, uh, the reason I'm most hopeful is uh, the people in this room, the people on this campus. The thing that has strengthened American foreign service, uh, foreign policy for a long time is our people. Uh, through pr the private sector, through NGOs, through um, advocacy groups, through the foreign service, through the United States military, through the intelligence service, uh, through public service, Lisa Brown right here in the front and Bester Young there. And um, that's the thing. We just have to get our people uh, more aggressively overseas and, and showing the world who we are. And when we do that, uh, I think if it's Jeff from Southern West Virginia or Ambassador Young, people understand what America stands for. Mr. Ram, may we begin with you, we end with you. Um, so to close off, I think I wanted to get to the core question asked uh, for this panel, which was what is the human and moral cost of remaining in the status quo? And for me, that is thinking of the lives that we've already lost is Joanna Medina, a Salvadorian trans woman who died in ICE custody. We think of Jacqueline who also died while trying to across uh, the border. We think of Oscar and Valeria. We think of Alan and Curdy. And we think of these people that have tragically lost their lives seeking a better life, seeking a future where they would be treated as humans. And that's what we need to get back to. That's what we need to really, that's the lens that this debate needs to have is thinking about the human and moral cost of our inaction. And that is to say that we need to start working. Thank you. Uh, I want to I want to thank uh, Mara and uh, Isabella and the team at Keo. I want to thank uh, Anna, Anna Misla who did so much of the work on this. Kim and Tessa who helped. Courtney, our friend in communications. Preview of coming attractions. Uh, at Notre Dame, October 18th, Religion Beyond Memes, Enhancing Public Discourse About Faith and Practice. It's about how we talk about faith in this current environment. It, and on Thursday, October 24th, Brexit, Brinksmanship, and the Future of Ireland, including the Irish Ambassador, on um, what's going on there. Both of these are at the Keogh School Washington office at DuPont Circle. Uh, Next Monday night on this stage, we will have Sister Helen Prejean talking about her new book at uh, five o'clock. On October 2nd, Georgetown will host Race, Faith, and Politics, among others with uh, Jim Wallace and Justin Gibney. Uh, we're gonna do some future activity around nationalism, Pope Francis, and Catholic social thought, which ought to be interesting. Ross Doubt that, Austin Ivory, the Pope's biographer, uh, our new Archbishop, uh, Wilton Gregory, is going to be here November 21st, uh, a part of the Francis Factor at six years with Helen Alvarez. 
and we are going to host the Washington premiere of a new film on PBS on Dorothy Day, and that'll be in January. I want to ask you to join me in thanking all of you who turned out, standing room only. And this wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.